I'm Sean Delaney, and today on the What Got You There podcast, I sit down with George Mumford, who's the performance coach who unlocked players like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, and countless other NBA stars and professional athletes. Now, if you want to know what it takes to reach that level of performance and then sustain it, how to tap into your natural flow state, and how to really unleash your greatness, then enjoy this conversation with George Mumford. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. George, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, actually. A little little rushed at times because I'm trying to squeeze a lot of stuff into a little time but overall i'm doing great so then how do you handle that how do you handle the, the constant rush the the times where there's just a lot more on your plate how do you stay focused and centered during those times just this you know i, I call it uh, you know the the you know make the next play <laughs> you know what's important now just really doing what i need to do and then worry about the other stuff for later so like this morning, for some reason, I thought the podcast was at uh, eleven fifteen, but that's because I I did a podcast last night with Sharon Salzberg. It's called the the Meta Hour, and it wasn't on my schedule, and so I had to do that. And then I knew about this one, and so there were some other things because I was in my workspace and I came home, and then there was a ton of stuff that I had to do. But I decided to take a little nap. So I, I slept an extra hour. I got up at five, but then I came home and then I slept a couple of hours. So I slept a little bit longer than I wanted to. So that kind of put me, you know, like there's things that I wanted to get done. I couldn't get done. So I just got what I had to get done, done. And it's just trying to stay in that space, the eye of the hurricane and just realize everything's going to be fine. But we have to, I have to just, just do the next thing. Talk more about the eye of the hurricane. I know that's an important huh? place. You talk more about the eye of the hurricane. I know that's an important place. You try to get your athletes to. Yes. So it's this idea. We have this quiet place within us, a place of rest. This is what Joseph Campbell called it when he was talking about it in the um, in the power of myth. He says, when we come out of that place, when we're not compelled by desire or fear or whatever the stories that are going on in the background about what should or should not be happening, that there's a quiet place. There's a place of rest inside of us. And so when we can, when we can be still and know, when we can access it, when we, when we can observe experience from that vantage point, then we can slow things down and we're able to just see things. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes when we, when we do that, but for the most part, we, we, when we're in flow, because you 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 get into it, and when you're in that silent space, there's a creativity and an intelligence that manifests in there, and that's how we get into the flow state. There's usually some high state of arousal or something that we're challenged a little bit, so that we have to be really keen on what's happening, hmm. and in the nervous system is built that way. We can do that when we when we see a sense of urgency. I I think I think like something novel or honest, you know, when when it's un it's things that are unpredictable and um also complexity when things get complex. And so just saying yes to whatever comes up. And even if I'm too in a hurry or if I'm making mistakes, I could just come back. I can just get back, you know, say, okay, just be in the moment. And what about just, those? Just feel my body where it is, and and just be where my body is. But just let the breath and the body anchor me in the present. That's really all you can do. So even though there's a lot going on, instead of jumping from branch to branch, you know, like we talk about monkey brain, it's just go to one branch at a time. You're there. You do what you can do. Then you jump to the next branch. You do what you can do. Then you jump to the next branch. But the key is when you leave one branch. Don't bring it with you mentally. <laughs> you have to be able to let it go and go to the next one. So that's that's the challenge. And when I get hiccups or when I get frustrated or whatever, I can see it as a as a as a silent witness. 
I say, oh, okay, well, that's interesting, and keep it moving. And then I can, I can always reflect on that later and figure out how I might be able to do it better. Mm -hmm. But the situation was such that there was so much stuff going on that um that it, it remind it required that I get that get more in contact with that 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 eye of the hurricane. What what I appreciate is you're two months away from this this 40 year journey into being able to to slow things down a bit and, and you still have to reset. You, you've got to pause. What do you do with with the athletes though that say, George, what the hell are you talking about? The quiet place? My mind has not shut off. It hasn't stopped. What is the first place that you try to get them to so they can slow down? Yes. Have have you ever been in the zone of flow? Have you had ever had the experience when things are happening effortlessly and whatnot? Yep. That's that's where the, that's that comes from that quiet place. So you've experienced it. Everyone's experienced it. So just giving them a giving them a, a sense of what that's like that you you you've done it already. So you can do it. But it's there, and sometimes we get it when we're just by ourselves, or when we're out in nature, or or if we're on a walk or a run. Especially runners or you know athletes, you know you're doing your your skills and and you're working on your your skill sets and whatnot. And then you have these times when the mind is quiet, mm -hmm. and and you're still you're in your body and you're moving. It's not like the body's here and then you're then you're attention your energy's out here so that you're trying to catch up your body is behind where either your body and your mind are in the same place hmm. so that's why the mind has to be in the moment so anchoring it and and that still point it's a, they used to call it the still quiet point i've heard that a lot when i was growing up and over the years but it's but there is a place of rest and so i, I talk about it when i do uh sort of a guided meditation or guided, um, I call it, usually call it arrival, but that's when we're going from one place to the other before I start a meeting, I have arrival and you just sit and just be aware. Like even now you're sitting and you're listening to me. You can be aware of the body and the seated posture and the fact that you're breathing in and breathing out and you can rest in that. So it's an awareness that allows us, you know, the knowing, the awareness allows us to just observe experience without trying to interpret what it means or judging it or pushing it away or pulling it towards us because that's what the nervous system does. If it's pleasant, we approach it. If it's unpleasant, we avoid it. And if it's and if we have indifference, we don't have, we, we don't care either way or the other, then we are in that neutral zone or that, you know, we just, you know, we're spacing out. Hmm. So your language arrival, that's essentially just transitioning between let's call it meeting to meeting. That's something you'll do. Upon entering yeah, a new or scenario. not just yes, not just meeting, but event from event. Hmm. Because what happens is, okay, let's just say, so I, I I made myself a smoothie, right? So I could still be down there listening to the the blender, or maybe I I didn't put the milk away or something or whatever some ingredient away. And so even though physically I'm here, mentally I'm still where I was. And so we can make a habit of being where we just were <laughs> or being where we're going to be later. <laughs> so it's all about the now. And that's how you anchor. The only time you can anchor is now. And when you can be here and breathe in and breathe out and noticing that I'm breathing in while sitting, breathing out, while sitting or breathing in, while talking to you and breathing out while I'm talking to you. That brings me in the moment. And in the moment, I'm in the now. I'm not in the was or the will be. Mm -hmm. I'm right here. And so the mind and body occupying the same space at the same time is pretty helpful. And it feels good. Yeah. I mean, you could you could spend an entire lifetime exploring just the concentration of the breath. What are some of the other breathing routines or activities you have people do that you've found to be beneficial? Well, obviously, well, what, what's beneficial when I start my own process is you, you have to have a, a, I don't want to say it, um, Eric Fromm in a, his book, Man for Himself, he talks about this idea of having frames of orientation and devotion. So you have to have a, a, pers a perspective or 
a point where you observe experience and it has to be connected with with feeling enough trust or realizing that this is a friendly universe and there's a lawfulness to it. And so we have to align ourselves with how things are. So you have to connect to some higher consciousness, higher power. You have to see that that there's, there's something beyond yourself. There's something greater than yourself. And, and there's a power, I guess, a power node or energy node we, you can connect to. Just like connect, you know, plugging something into the wall socket. If it's your iPhone or some other device, uh, it needs power to run. And so you have to have a, some some uh, philosophy that allows you to be vulnerable and to be willing to see what's in front of you, regardless of how it may make you feel. So you need in the, in the mindful athlete. I talk about faith. You know, it's the same old thing. I have it all begins with this. I have this water bottle. It's at the halfway. It's not quite, but imagine it's at the halfway point. So how you view that water bottle determines whether you're coming from scarcity or fear or abundance and love or a growth mindset. So it's half full. So that's a, that's a philosophy. That's a way of being. And Einstein talked about this. He said, we have to make a decision whether it's friendly or unfriendly universe. And I don't want to go through the whole thing, but if I were to go through the whole thing, if it's unfriendly, then you use all your resources to destroy or deny the threat, mm -hmm. okay? And if it's neither friendly nor unfriendly, then it doesn't matter what you do. But if if it is indeed a friendly universe, then you will learn, you use your love and reason to align yourself with how things are. And when you're in that alignment, uh, things, things work better. And you have a, a sense that no matter what happens to me, speaking for myself, it could be back. It could be devastating. Whatever it happens to me, Frank will talk about this in the, you know, in the concentration camps. In the space between stimulus and response, you get you have the freedom and power to choose. So, I if I react to something, that means I'm not giving it a thought. I'm just reacting, knee jerk to it, which usually, unless I've trained myself to react in a in a skillful way. That's helpful. But if I haven't trained myself and I'm reacting to something, that's a choice I'm making, even if I don't think I have that choice. Mm -hmm. But if I realize that no matter what happens to me, I get to choose my response to it. Mm -hmm. And Victor Franco talks about unavoidable suffering, that you can choose to have an attitude and a quality of being where you choose to respond to it with dignity, with grace with wisdom, with understanding versus just reacting and, and not having any control or any making any, any age, having any agency to realize that you can be, you can pause and you can choose how do I want to react? So given this is happening, who, who do I want to be? What do I, what do I bring to it? That sort of thing. And he also said that when we find meaning in suffering, it ceases to be suffering. Mm. so when you have unavoidable death or something is happening you can choose your attitude you can embrace it say yes to it and i'm going to live with dignity with love with compassion instead of succumbing to fear and feeling like out of control because just that little modicum of control is enough to give us a sense that you know we have some agency Explain does that make any there. sense? It does. And I saw your posture change there when you were talking about agency. Yeah. Explain to me what you were doing there with your yeah. posture. Well, I wasn't doing anything. That's a nervous system saying yes. <laughs> there we go. Yes. It's, you know, you, you can do the muscle testing and whatnot. And when you test things, uh, when, when, you're, when you're aligned with life, when you choose life, there's an energy and there's a, you know, a strength that comes out of that. When we connect with that, that's why there's something about being in love or being a vulnerable and being willing to see what's there. There's an energy. It's more life. It's, we're aligning ourselves with the way things are. We're aligning ourselves with life, that life energy. When we say yes to life, that's very different energy than saying, I don't know or no. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I, I got you. Know, this is going to be awesome. 
George, I, I know you're a feeler and I know you, you sense other people's energy. Who's the player that you've been around that has had the greatest aura or energy that just their presence was different? That's pretty obvious. So MJ. it's Jordan. MJ and Kobe, but MJ, yeah. Explain, so two, two of the greatest of all time. Explain the difference that you felt between their two energies. It's the same, except for one more intense, because one is a mentor and the other one is a mentee. You're saying. <laughs> and 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 Jordan, the first time I met, it was 1993, October. And I, I went to training training camp to work with the Bulls, my first interaction with them. And MJ was still there. He was, you know, in the locker room. I don't know if he, you know, I guess he was uh, still, you know, had the stuff there and was still work out, so wanted to play, but he was there. And when I went in to introduce myself to meet him, I could feel his his presence, his ability to be in that eye of the hurricane. That's where I came up with the whole idea. I named my mm -hmm. company the eye of the hurricane because what I've witnessed about him from afar and then up close is that when things get chaotic, he gets calmer. He had this ability to get the 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 more chaotic it got, the more calm he got. But so just noticing that, and I'm not even sure if he knew that that's what he was doing, but that was what I was observing from afar. And then having to work with him when he came back, that was a different energy. I mean, mm -hmm. I could kind of feel it. Now everybody has aura, so everybody has a certain way, but I just noticed. I mean, it it was something that hit me without me looking for it. It wasn't like I was going in like, what's this guy's aura, you yeah. know, or whatever, because Dr. J had or has an aura, has had has charisma. But that was, a, I noticed how different his was. Mm -hmm. So he's vibrating at a different level. So we can talk about physical talent and all of that other stuff. But in terms of, and I'm sure that came from his, his work ethic and his ability to access power. I mean, it might, uh, he had because I think about it in in the in the realm of um, insight meditation, or in the realm from what I learned um, of studying the teachings of the Buddha. He, he talks about right effort as a as a path factor, as something that you know you have these uh, seven factors of awakening, so you you really you know get to the optimum level uh, uh, you can have as a human being and he talked one of them is is right effort or effort and so there's three stages that they talk about that you can go through the first stage is you need to have a launching effort and you need to have enough enthusiasm to get beyond lethargy or doubt whatever or, ap or apathy so once you get through that then the, the second stage is persistence being able to stay at it and keep going keep going, keep going. And when you do that, you get to a place of invincibility or where you have access to a lot of energy. Now, I, I'll take Magic at his word when they had the dream team and he said Michael could stay up all night and could do things, you know, play golf and go out and play. And my suspicion is that he has, he's developed that ability to access uh, a lot of power. And that, and you see it in, in, when you're in the zone or in flow, it's effortless effort. And I'm sure you as a lacrosse player had moments or you witnessed moments where people were, were unconscious. That's what I mean, unconscious. What they're really saying is there's no consciousness of self. It's just this thing happening. It's happening. It's flowing through this person. I guess that's one might be one reason why we call it flow. But yeah, I, I think that there's some, some of that. Um, I, I think that he has access, you know, in those days he had access to power. And and I I experienced it my myself where where sometimes I you know to me it's and this guy wrote about the sleeping prophet Edgar Casey. There's there's a ways of relating of self regulating where some thoughts are energy zapping, or they're leading us down the path of fear, doubt, and insecurity. I'll just say fear. And then there's thoughts that are inspiring, encouraging. And you can see in my body, you can see just a certain perspective or certain words have a certain energy. And then there's there's energy right right there. 
And that's the thing. And I give you an example. If I were to say to you that uh, I'm assuming wherever you are in, in the couple rooms, you know, down in that same space you're in, there's a dentist with a dentist chair waiting to give you a root canal. I guarantee you, when you leave where you are to go there, you'll be procrastinating. You'll be like, you won't have any, your energy will be diff a different way. But now let's say you like money. And I say, you know, you have the, you know, you just hit the power ball for $5 billion. Now your energy to go down to that room would be what? You might not even touch the floor. <laughs> but neither one of those are true, but you thinking it creates access to power mm. or energy or joy or excitement. I want to talk, I want to talk more about that because I was literally just thinking about this last week. I was on a call with someone and I forget the tennis player and he won, whether it was Wimbledon or the U S open, one of the biggest events. And he was doing an interview and he said, I had adrenaline coursing through my body for 48 hours straight. And I was thinking about it, that his championship point, essentially all it was, was his, him hitting a tennis ball over a net. And it was his interpretation of the experience that allowed that type of energy to course through his body for the next 48 hours. Well, yes, and he's calling it adrenaline. But adrenaline, man, you can, you can course through your body. That's different, but there's an energy that's not, It's we call it dopamine. You know, there's certain chemicals that get stimulated. And that's what's interesting when we get in, into a threat or whatever, or you can, you can see where these folks will fall and hurt their leg or something, but then then uh nature the body will take over and and you know spruce it up with endorphins and and you know all other kinds of um chemicals that allow the body to be able to do what they do i mean i saw this this special one it was about the human brain and it talked about these firefighters that were fighting a fire and the fire came back on them and the body just slowed things down and they were able to go and, and protect, you know, there's something that, but it, it seems to be in in times of severe crisis or times when your life is at risk that we're able to tap into, you know, and the body can release these chemicals and I guess electrical impulses as well that, that actually allow the brain to slow down or speed up or to send out some, uh, some um, endorphins so that you don't feel the pain that you're in. And you see people that sometimes they say, well, I was injured, but I just worked through it. But that's, we have this masterpiece within. We have this, this organism that, that's smarter than any computer we can think about. Just think about all the trillions and billions of cells. I, I, I was watching a program yesterday. They said there's trillions of microbes in our body that helps us break down food and all sorts of things. So it's just an amazing, we have this amazing ability. And when we can tap into that, greatness when we can access it that's when we find the flow that's when we discover success so sometimes we do it in in bite sizes or you know miniature events and sometimes it happens over an extended period of time but it's the same thing you can be in flow in just one one sequence you know you're playing lacrosse and, and maybe you haven't you know you're old for seven or old for five or whatever george that's not happening come on it's, Huh? I said that's not happening. Yeah, but <laughs> but then on the last shot, you go down there and it's like nobody's there. Everybody slow down. And you're just breezing by them, and boom, you score. What's that? What's that state that you try to get your athletes into just prior to a game? Uh, thank you for asking that. I don't because when you try to get into a state, that's a problem try to get in the flow that's a problem then if you're not dead then you're forcing it it's really more what i'm trying to get them to do is to be present and just be yourself and have fun but you did you've done all the training so get out of the way and just let it express itself mm -hmm. so so what i'm the state i'm trying to get them into is the state of now and have confidence and be observant and be willing to make mistakes and to correct them without beating yourself up without being judgmental i think it was uh from, the, from tim galway's book the inner game of tennis he essentially yes. says that the art of letting go um 
that is the key to it is to let go of the inclination to judge ourselves. And without that, it's going to be extremely difficult to access that, that inner game that he talks about. So yeah, what he you... talked about self one and self two. Yeah. So self two has to be the self one can't be there. Self one can't be in control. Self two is so self one is the he's talking about the I'm right handed. So my left brain, the linear brain. He's talking about the nonlinear brain or or the if we look at it, fear one, you can see it's fear, one is 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 love. But it's interesting because we need that. We need both, we need the whole brain. We need that fight, flight, or freeze, because that fight, we can connect with the fight where we're going to struggle through and we're going to keep bringing more energy to bear on the problem, on the situation, rather than the the flee or the freeze. Now we can get to the point where you're doing that, but you got to be guided by seeing the whole picture or your intuitive hmm. aspect. The other, the right brain that sees the whole picture, one plus one equals six. So it's... It's understanding that, and really what it comes down to is just pure awareness without judging and just letting what's in front of us speak to us in its own language so that we're not interpreting things, we're waiting and we're, we're seeing things in fresh and new ways. And then by doing that, we'll, out of that silence, out of that stillness, there's a wisdom and a creativity that will mm. express itself. And so I think in athletic competition, we experience that physically. And now it's just now how to do it so that you can do it more often. So it becomes a way of being and not something that just happens because I like to say a non-digital broken clock is right twice a day. So a lot of averages catch up with you and you just have to figure it out how to, how to sustain it. And that's what I teach. That's what I'm talking about in my work is how to access the greatness within you in ways where it will show up when you need it. But if you try to force it, it's different than allowing it to happen because you understand the conditions in which it will arise, it will manifest. Hmm. So in your new book, Unlocked, what exactly do you mean with the word unlocked? Whatever's in the way, you the stopping you, it's a hindrance or it hinders you. So I could use uh, everyday experience example would be uh, they have a name for it but the light switches with the dimmer switch on it so when i'm talking about unlock i'm saying you have the light on but the dimmer is tuned turned down to some mm -hmm. you know all the way down or way down when i say unlock that means getting rid of the whatever's in the way to allow you to to increase the amount of light you let through and so to be unlocked, it's like you're locked up. Like we just in COVID, what's it like to be in the house and be locked up? You can't express yourself. You can't go to the movies. You can't meet friends. You can't do things. I'm talking about on some level, internally, we lock ourselves down. We have a system of hideouts where we hide out and we're not, we're not able to let that love light shine or let that divinity shine. Mm -hmm. So we're encrusted in the shell. And unlocking is about, I guess the metaphor would be the caterpillar that transforms into a butterfly. We're in the chrysalis, but we don't know we're in the chrysalis and we're not trying to break out. The butterfly and the thing that, that the animal realm has over us, they have instincts. So the, the they're programmed to swim upstream if you're a salmon. They're programmed, to, okay, I have to break out of this chrysalis. And so they break out of the chrysalis and you have to struggle. And then when they break out the chrysalis, and there's a story about the, this little boy who finds a chrysalis, then he takes it home, and then he takes some scissors, and he tries to help the little being get out of the chrysalis. And what happens is when the, when the, be when the little being come, you know, break, comes through that hole, it's ill-formed, and, it and it falls to the ground. It can't fly. So what's the st moral of the story is no struggle, no swag, no struggle, no fly. That is the struggle and breaking out that gives us the strength to fly. So I say it's the same for us. So when we can unlock through that struggle, whatever the struggle is, and then when we emerge from there, we'll, we'll have we'll have the wings to fly. What have you seen out of the people that go through the struggle, but actually come out of it with the wings as opposed to more damage? Because I'm sure you've seen plenty of people who hit the struggle 
and they spiral down. Yeah, well, that's what I'm talking about, the persistence, the, the, the continuous application of, of balanced energy. I talk about it in right effort. You, you, you have to keep. So there's another way of thinking about getting in the flow, that there's a struggle, then there's the release, then you get in the flow. So what happens, we over, overwhelm our, ourselves. You know, we just struggle. We learn as much as we can, and we get to the point, and we're, we're really working at this problem really hard. And and then when we when we release, when we take a break, we step away from it. Then we might be taking a shower or walking out, doing our run or doing some other activity. We might even be playing a guitar, some recovery activity. And then the the answer comes comes to us. And so it's it's understanding that the struggle is part of it. It's like yes, you gotta say yes to everything. You gotta say yes. This is struggling, but this is where the gold is. This is what Joseph Campbell said. He said your life is where your pain is. So if I look at myself, so my substance abuse and my chronic pain uh, turned out not to be a roadblock, but a stepping stone. That's what Marcus Aurelius said. I had a quote we put out recently, what's in the way becomes the way. Mm -hmm. So I said, it's like, what's in front of you? What's in front of you is what's in front of you. And that's the way forward. There's no path to mastery. Mastery is the path. Does that make full. sense? It does. So, so this is this is the thing. So it's really like people. Were, well, what's the formula, George? You know, how do you do this? Why? How do you do that? Well, I could tell you what I did in the past, but everything's changing. So I have to, I have to be fluid. I have to see things in new and fresh ways. But that can be frightening or it can be invigorating mm. because because I'm learning for learning's sake, and you know, learning and achievement leads to more enthusiasm and then you get to a point where you have this energizing enthusiasm so we have to be say yes to life and embrace it and, and go go you know you got to be happy first before you can achieve things we think we have to achieve before we're happy research says opposite so everything is saying all we have is now and how you manage now how you manage this moment how you see yourself how you see things is going to determine who you become and what you do it's too simple. Speaking but of, but you have to train yourself to be in a moment which we're not. We're always and and we're valued by doing multiplicity of things at once. We're valued by being really busy and being important and all this stuff. We're valued of of answering the question before we even get the question. We 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 have this unrealistic way of just thinking, ah, oh, this is how it is. When in actuality. It's just really about being in the moment and being on, being yourself. What is flow? Flow is just um, spontaneity. But to be spontaneous, your mind, body, heart, and, and spirit have to be in alignment. There has to be integrity for us to just act spontaneously. That's what flow is. It's just being spontaneous from moment to moment, but of one's free will. That's what spontaneity means. So it's this idea of understanding that we are wired for success. We have... Uh, Maxwell Maltz calls it the automatic success mechanism, ASM, but he also talks about the automatic failure mechanism. So just like neuroplasticity, we can train the brain, brain, we can create circuits, but they can go negative or they can go positive. They can go based on fear. They can go based on love or growth. And so we need to understand that and how to use it. How, how do I use my whole brain? You know, they talk about the, you know, the you know, reptilian brain, you know, the emotional brain and then the thinking brain and that that we need all three. They got to be used in harmony. We can't just say, well, I don't want to be in fight or flight or freeze or the reptilian brain. If that's the oldest brain. We don't need it. But when you're walking across the street and the car comes, that's what's going to get your butt out of the way. You can't contemplate. Should I move or not? So we have to understand that there's some there's some verb gifts we have, but if we don't develop them, if we don't own them, if we don't embrace them, they don't exist. Develop, own, and embrace. I'm thinking about the last few decades for you. It's going to be 40 years sober coming up in July, right? Well, it'll be 39. 39? Yeah, but I'll be going into my 40th year, obviously. Uh, it's Yeah. So in two months, when July 30th, it'll be 39 years. So during 1984, congratulations. During those 39 years, 
what did you what what have you done pretty consistently during those thirty nine years to keep developing that you think has been instrumental for you? Prayer, meditation, service. Hmm. So it's been, but it's been every day, every morning, waking up. Like I, I got out of routine, but this morning I woke up at five and I had to drive home and whatnot. But in that quiet time, uh, just, just, just reading, studying, meditating, and praying, and, and also just realizing that, you know, I'm, I'm here to help other people. So it's this, it's. It's this interesting thing. I call it, I have all of these Georgisms. I call them, um, you got to be selfish to be selfless. So me spending time with myself, myself, and training my mind, my heart, my body, and my soul, my spirit, feeding them, then I can give to others. When I'm selfish, that I can be selfless. Mm -hmm. So it's not for me, it's for the great, for, for, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, getting clean and sober and staying in that being clean and sober, that ripple affects other people. It's going to affect the whole universe. And so it's not just for me, it's for the greatest, highest good. And so that's what I've been consistent in is, is connecting with a higher power. And like I, like I said, just this idea of, of just getting with myself and, and just embracing the fact that that I, you know, I have a masterpiece within. I have this tremendous potential that that is unlimited, and it can be accessed or developed. Only I can develop it, and to the degree that I develop it, that will be reflected in 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 my, what I do and who I become, the kind of life I have, and so. In the Bible, I remember the saying, "You shall know them by their fruit." <laughs> so you got to—I plant, been planting seeds for these thirty-nine years or so, and now some of the seed, some of the uh, fruits being planted. So I, I had the attitude of a Johnny Appleseed, whether it's my own development or others. I'm just going beyond the the legend, going beyond the you know amongst the countryside and just throwing seeds, tossing seeds, mm -hmm. and they come back around and see which ones a bearing fruit or not. And so as long as they have fertilization and sunlight and water, they'll grow. So some of the seeds won't grow, but some will. And my job isn't to sit, stand there and wait for the seeds to grow. It's just to plant them and keep moving. You were talking about the the selfishness allows you to be selfless going outwards. One of the, the tricky things I'm sure you have to wrestle with is just that, that dy dynamic tension in team environments between the me and the we. Yes. How do you work through that? Well, you work through it by by having core values and a worthy cause. You have to have some rules for engagement. So I know, I mean, everybody has different core values and, and, and you can see what happens sometimes. But I know, of course, Steve Kerr is one of my guy, you know, really good friend uh, that I worked with when he was with the Bulls. That was probably, what, 30 years ago almost? something like that. Uh, but um, my understanding is the four core values of the Golden State Warriors are um, joy, mindfulness, compassion, competition. So it's interesting because joy, you got to start off with, they call it the broaden and build theory, that when your mind is at positive, Sean Accord's, Accord's done a lot with the happiness research when you have positive and then Barbara Fredrickson has a book called Positivity and all that. So it's something about being at positive that allows us to see clearer and and the, it, it just it just enhances our ability to perform. They call it the broaden and build theory. So having joy or some positive emotion before you start observing things or performing is really crucial because it gets you in the, the glass half full and you're coming from this idea that, okay, there's challenges, there's complexity, there's uncertainty, but I know I can choose my response. And when I choose wrongly, now I learned that lesson. So the next time it comes up, I can choose right. But now I'm getting more confident and more trust in the process because I'm aligned with how things are and that I have 
a masterpiece within. I have this ability to uh, do stuff. We, I have ability, whatever I hold in mind, I manifest. I, I become it. That's the strangest secret is we become what we think about. So how often are we doing a Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg? I got my mind on blank and blank on my mind. <laughs> so that's it. That's it. I got my mind on money, money on my mind. I got hate. Um, 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 oh, I got hate on my mind and, you know, I'm, my mind's on hate and I have hate on my mind. Hmm. My mind's on blank and I have this on my mind. So from moment to moment, we are co-creators. Whatever we have this ability as human beings, what we hold in mind. Hmm. And you don't have to take my word for it. Just think about it. So when you focus on on what you can do, then you're going to be in joy and, and you're going to, oh, what you want versus what you didn't get or what you want to get. That's a different psychology than just focusing on making the next play. You said to me, how do you do it? Well, you you just make the next play. In this moment, you can change the whole momentum. You can change everything just by being present and then making the best choice you can and learning from it and realize that we learn from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. But we have to develop this self-regulation that allows me to go from mistake to mistake to mistake without losing enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And that is, and we, we call it, I know when I was first getting clean it was called anthony i think it was bendura he talked about um this idea of um what's it called uh self-efficacy strong self-efficacy and so what happens is when you know you can create this is what my experience has been being addicted and and not be able to create space creating space between stimulus and response so i get to choose my response. And so I get to the point where I develop some some resiliency, uh, some stress hardiness, because I know that just by choosing that little modicum of control expands. And then now all of a sudden, because I may I know that no matter what happens, no matter what comes up, I can say yes to it and choose my response. Then I start getting this strong self-efficacy belief, which means is self mastery, self control, and so now I know because I have that strong sense of, of self or strong sense of can do, that I'm gonna I'm going to challenge myself more, and when I'm moving towards a goal, I am going to stick with it because I have more patience and confidence that it's going to work out, and so the risk get richer in, in that in that sense. And so being able to understand, and then it changes everything. And so now what happens, and I can see this in my own uh, process. When I first started, I, I hated speaking in public. I just shake and all sorts of things. But now, and then when I have an event coming up, whether it's sports or, you know, just giving a talk or just meeting with somebody, a uh, meeting or negotiation, we start to understand that our thoughts, so even though, some of us may have intrusive thoughts. We get to the point where we know that we can't control the thoughts, but we don't. We just direct our attention to other thoughts. And so we know we control them. Like I think the saying is, you can't stop the the, the birds of worry from landing on your head, but you can stop them from building a nest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the idea is, so we start to understand we can control our thinking and we can redirect our attention. And so by doing that and knowing that those thoughts will come, but we can keep them in the background, like background music that gives us a sense of control. And then because we feel that way, then we feel better about ourselves, but we are willing to set more challenging goals and to be able to see things. But now what is thinking? So for me, before I'd be given a presentation and I'm thinking about all the ways it can go wrong or what I have to prepare for now I have five or six ways how it's going to work out. So thoughts, so we play out these scenarios and we are not conscious of this, the self-talk and the scenarios that we have, we have to take control of that. We have to notice that and, and change them in alignment with who we say we are, where we're saying we're going. So I'll give you an example and the audience probably knows this. How many conversations have you had with somebody and they're not there? It seems countless throughout the day almost. 
And that's yeah. the way they turn out. If you really pay attention to what conversation you have is the one that you'll have in real life. So like I said, we create stuff. So why not have the conversation when things work out where 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 it's amicable and the person can hear you and you can hear them. And so that's that's what I'm saying. So even so when you go into it, we call it expectation. Uh, you know, you know, when you expect to do good, you do good. But if you you're expectation outcome outcome expectation is what, what they call it so when you can visualize i'm not saying being pie in the sky and just imagining things without putting in the work i mean really putting in the work and then expecting it to pay off and it may not pay off in one year two years it may take 10 years it may take a long time i try i, I was at writing a book it took me 20 years before i could write my book the mindful athlete and the, and the paradox of that is once i stopped trying to write it it wrote itself what do you well, mean I by that? Up 20 years, I struggled to write a book. What do you mean when you tr stop trying to write? Because sometimes we try to do things instead of allowing things to happen. Because mm -hmm. then there's pressure on us. We got to do this yeah. and we're all uptight. We're in that that half empty. And we're doing it and we're doing it. But then once we just form the intention and get out of the way, then it happens. Mm -hmm. And and that's, a, that's, the, that's the, the genius of it is this... Be have a clear goal, clear intention, and then then relax and allow it to happen. There was something you wrote in your book. I'm going to read from your new book, Unlocked Here, in a second, because this really just kind of intrigued me. And you said, when you're experienced in teaching meditation, you can feel people's internal state as they meditate. You can see it in their posture and read it in the tension or, their, or lack thereof in the face muscles. You can hear it like a score of music in the quality of their breath. And then you say both Michael, meaning Michael Jordan and Kobe were without question, my best meditation students. And then you go on to say the best athletes are also the best meditation students. Why do you think that is? Well, it was, you know, we call it meditation, but it's really the ability to be in the moment and to have confidence and be clear about what your intentions are and how you can do it in your own unique way, how you can express yourself. Bruce Lee said that martial arts is to honestly express yourself. So what it means is I have an intention. And so I'm able to have a thought and then perform in alignment with, with my intention is being able to do it, being able to execute. And so, you know, people use meditation and it's not so much meditation. It's about really about making wise choices, creating space between stimulus and response and getting clear about what you're doing, who you are, and then expressing yourself honestly. That's what Bruce would say, to express yourself honestly. So once Kobe stopped trying to be Michael and decided to be Kobe, that, that's it. But you, we emulate other people. I'm sure Michael Jordan, I think David Thompson, probably Dr. J and, and others. I know Dr. J used to you know, emulate Connie Hawkins and Elgin Bella and some of the other guys. So there's we get these um ideas and we we we're on this we stand on the shoulders of giants, but then we have to make it our own. Just like if you play in a band, you play other people's music, or you might do like Jimi Hendrix, you just take Bob Dylan's song book and you and you record along the watchtowers and and people think that he wrote that song. No, that's a Bob Dylan song. So you could do that, but you have to make it your own. And so that's the challenge. I always say you got to be you. So my job is to help you be you. Okay, Sean. So it's not like you to you want to be like uh, whoever, you know, whether it's, you know, um, uh, the best announcer, you know, uh, Harry Carey, or, you know, if you want you talk about um, some, you want to great, do some Harry you know, Carey impersonations. Yeah, <laughs> or, or whoever whoever the standard is, uh, you emulate them, but then you got to do it in your own unique way. And you have to express yourself honestly. And we have a bullshit meter. So what you were alluding to, it's not just meditation. It's about nonverbal communication. 93% of it, it's, it's nonverbal tonality and body language. You can see that. You don't have to be a meditator to see that. You don't have to be a meditator to, to know that someone is inauthentic or being phony but by developing the mind to be able to see clearly and not be so reactive 
we're able to we're able to see things more clearly and be able to see them more you know like right away because you can you can tell it's just something about being in that eye of the hurricane where you just know shit i just i don't i don't you know i i don't i understand it but i don't have to prove it it's just we know this like when we have a, tu a tuition to do something and we ignore it and then we realize that we made a wrong you know that we should have listened then then we beat ourselves up and we we tend to doubt it but once we start listening to it even though it's telling us something we don't want to hear then the more we do that the more that still small voice that's inside is easily drowned out and so we have to be able to listen to it be still and know or be quiet and let it speak mm. so does this make sense so this is like the we have tremendous capacity and we're just scratching the surface we just have to figure out uh, how to access it and develop it and it's helpful if we develop it for the highest good not for the ego or for personal gain that makes sense it absolutely does I i'm wondering for you when did you feel like you were in alignment with yourself, meaning your authentic self was was coming out more and you weren't looking up to other people trying to emulate. You said, you know what? I'm George Mumford. This is who I am. Yeah, it's interesting because I have had moments of it, but my aunt, Julia, we call her aunt sister. And she's a fascinating woman. She was um, like my grandfather was a, a Baptist minister, but she, she, um, was a Muslim, you know, uh, and she was like an imam. So she was high up in that hierarchy and and she spoke, uh, she learned Arabic and all of that stuff, but she was really, really an amazing woman. And she said to me one day, she said, you know, you're, you're doing what you were put here to do. Mm. You're living, and she, she was amazingly, and she just, so that's when I got conf I got confirmation from my art that I was living an authentic life and I was being myself, even though I felt that, but I was still evolving. And it's challenging because I would say, and I was reading one of my books, I was studying this morning, and and it talks about we have this idea that we're as people wear these fixed points. And so when we do that, when we're fixed and we have these stories about who we are, it keeps us locked in the past. What we really are are ever changing events, and so on some level we're becoming. We we don't always we we're always in the becoming uh, aspect, and so our core values allow us to help us what we're doing. And what helps me is when I want to do something. Then the question is, who do I need to be to do it? So if I want to, if I want love, I have to be love. If I want peace, I have to be peace. And so in that process of being peace or being love i get to discover more and more of myself that's ever changing that's an ever changing event but the core values you know principles don't change they're timeless and they're universal uh and and they're ever you know they're self-evident they're universal and they're timeless and so if i align myself with divinity with with love curiosity truth wisdom, integrity, selfless service, compassion, courage, then I'm going to be expressing myself fully, even though that self is a on ever changing event. And so who, who I was five years ago, 10 years ago, even a year ago, when I wrote that mindful athlete eight years ago, and that came out, it, I'm, there's been so much change since then. And even a book, I we finished a book a while ago, but I've been out doing um podcasts like this and, and talking to people and i'm learning more about unlocked than i was when i wrote the book because when i wrote the book we got to a certain point and then i i read the book at least three four times because i did the audio book and just the when we do the review of the book you know just going through it several times i feel like i know more about being unlocked than i did before and next week i'll know more mm because it's a process. So my definition of success, which helps with this incremental stuff, and this is how the brain works, that's how uh, neurons, neuro, you know, when they talk about um, this idea of connecting brain cells uh, or using, creating these neural nets, neuroplasticity and stuff like that, everything starts with increments. And so each day we go over it and we learn more and more 
and more. So if you keep talking about a subject, and, and this is what I say in the book, and it's my experience, if you want to learn something, teach it. Because mm -hmm. you have more opportunities to talk about it, not just within yourself, but with others and asking others and seeing how other people are doing it. And so I feel like I'm learning and growing because I'm I'm teaching. And I and of course, a lot of us, at least myself, I don't want to be a phony. So I'm going to be the message. <laughs> I'm not going to just say, OK, you, this is what you should do. And I remember a quote, I think it was Neville Goddard. He says, it was easier for me to teach. 20 people what to do than for me to do what I'm teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a certain special effort and a certain, I guess, interest and motivation and commitment to really be authentic with mean, yourself because it's easier to, because it's easier when you do or you're who somebody else wants you to be or what society believe, believes you to be. You don't, you don't get the, the blowback. You don't get to deal with the anxiety of, of what what Kierkegaard called the alarming possibility of being able. One side of the coin is, is freedom. The other side is uncertainty, anxiety. But the anxiety is to be embraced and and to be um, and to be understood. Hmm. Yeah, along the lines of that, my friend Tom Morgan has a great quote. He says, if you seek control, prepare to sacrifice life. If you seek life, prepare to sacrifice control. Yes, I like that one. Yeah, that, that's a good one. That that's really a good one. So life is just, you know, you 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 have to show up. You don't have to, but I choose every week. I do a at home with George, and and I create the possibility of embracing, saying yes to life, and at the same time generating hope, so that you know that it's an opportunity in front of you, not a curse. But that's what, how we learn when we say yes to life. And I I think there's a book recently that I became aware of Victor Franco has a book called you saying yes to life I think that's yeah book. I think that was his uh some of his writings that had never come out um yes. recently republished yes and a lot of uh recently rebuttal because they didn't think it was him hmm. yeah but but regardless of whoever wrote it it's, it's, it's <laughs> there's true. some good stuff in there <laughs> there's some really there's some good stuff in it and you can check it out and that's what I encourage people don't you can believe, you don't have to believe what I say, but see if you can have a direct experience of it. One thing, George, I, I want to highlight here is you've mentioned it over the past thirty nine years, you've averaged reading a book a week during that time. Right. I think that's a testament to your nonstop, continual growth and putting the work to yourself. I just want to highlight that because you bring up so many different things. You brought up neuroscience, spirituality, multiple religions here, and it's very yeah. clear you're able to get to the levels you've gotten to because of consistent practice of, of continuing to learn during all that time. So I, I just yeah, wanted to that, highlight that. Yeah, that I, one of the things I learned re, write, writing this book is that one of the reasons what I believe that I connected deeply with, with uh, Michael and Kobe is because I have that, that mama mentality. And I didn't recognize that. But when I said, well, look what you did, you know, like all these books and who does that? You know, I lived in a meditation center for six years and and I attended a class just uh, watching teachers teach six years. So who does that? Mm -hmm. And I had to acknowledge and embrace the fact that that I have that that um, I'm pursuing excellence and wisdom with grace and ease. And when people talk about the mama mentality, Kobe specifically doing that is, yeah, I, I've, I've always had that, but I didn't claim it. Well, writing the book, I had to acknowledge, wow, man, look what you did. You know, who, who does that? <laughs> and I said, somebody who's committed, somebody who has that mama mentality, although I don't call it that, but that's his thing, the mama mentality is that we, and we all have it. We all do it to some degree, but can we do it more consistently and and, and commit to a life of of uh, of service where, where we don't settle, we don't stop. We're always looking it push that envelope. We're comfortable being uncomfortable, but we're struggling. And that struggle leads to swag, but it also leads, leads to flow. Mm. So no struggle, no swag. So the struggle is, and you don't have to look for struggle. It's there. It's just, you just have to just keep, keep on keeping on that progressive realization of a worthy ideal or goal, that success. So you don't have to, so you're, you know, and when you're successful, that makes, 
that it sets up the next moment. That sets up, you have more stress hardiness. You have more resilience because you know that you're going to get there and it's going to be a zigzag. It's not going to be straight, but the zigzag, you can enjoy the journey and just understand my motto is joy now and never. The joy of discovery, the joy of just being fully alive and being fully expressed or having the intention to express myself honestly and with joy and with compassion. George, you're one of the people, the few people on this planet who've spent time with with Jordan, Kobe, and Phil Jackson. Those are three people I've studied a great deal on. You can on my website, I've got extreme deep dives on all three. Do you have a favorite story? It could be of any one of them that you included in the book Unlocked that when you think of or hear those names that just come to mind for you? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, it, 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 it's, it's, it's hilarious because I think it was 23 years ago. It might even be pretty close to the day. Uh, I was first year working with the Lakers, Phil's first year coaching the Lakers, and it's the seventh game of the Western Conference Finals. We're playing against um, Portland Trail Blazers, and they had an amazing team. And Scottie Pippen played for that team, and Scottie's one of my main guys. So that was very conflictual for me, especially when they beat us on the home court, and he came over and he hugged me. I said, oh, that's not good. That's not, you know, not going to go over well, Blocker. But, uh, <laughs> but it was the fourth quarter. It was 10 minutes and 28 seconds to go, and they were up, I want to say, 15 points. And Phil called timeout. And I was sitting behind the bench. So when the team came into the huddle, he said, we got them just where we want them. One stop, one score. And that's the mentality mm. that all those cats have. It's like, okay, you know, this is this is a challenge. We're up for it and we're and we we can do this. This is how we do it. And this is, you know, and so I talk about uh when you have skin in the game, that means your conversation lead to action all the people in the stands all of the reporters and all the folks that you know even could be family members and, and and coaches of the players they don't have any skin in the game people on on the floor have skin in the game what they say leads to action and that's what leadership is you change the occurring for the team and the team believe we could do this and we ended up winning by like seven points or something like that but it was a tremendous comeback and so I would say that would be Phil's Phil's moment. I guess you could see um, uh, one moment for Kobe would be his last game. And Shaq was telling him to score all these points. And Kobe said, no, nah, man, I, I'm not going there. I'm just going to play and let the game come to me. Go 60 points. And MJ, uh, I think um, the iconic moment for him is when he was playing against the Utah Jazz. I think it was 1997. When he when he got sick or they gave him Gatorade or something, and he was playing amazingly, and then when the when the timeout came, Scotty had to carry him off the court. So there's that that not no quit that tenacity that this ability to go beyond. Uh, it's just something that's really powerful. So those would be I would say those three stories. I get, there's a ton of them, but those are the three that when you ask me that question, those are the ones that come to mind. Yeah, George, thanks for sharing that. Say you could do this, long-form conversation, interview anyone dead or alive. Who would you love to do that with? I have a conversation with somebody dead or alive. Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'd probably go for the Buddha and Jesus. Mm. <laughs> I'm just saying, but as far as contemporary... Uh, no, no, people, no, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's pause on, on Buddha and Jesus. What are you asking them? How to be myself and how what can I give to the world? Hmm. I think that's a beautiful place to end this one, George. But I, 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 I <laughs> definitely want it. to know I, we we need yeah. we need to we need to direct the listeners. I mentioned your first book, The Mindful Athlete, Secrets of Pure Performance. Incredible book for me, unlocking me as as an athlete and then transitioning to the business world. And then your new book, Unlock, Embrace Your Greatness, Find the Flow, and Discover Success. Of course, we'll have everything linked up in the show notes uh, where the listeners can purchase both these books. Anything you want to leave the listeners with around your new book, Unlocked? I know we covered some of the foundational ways you think, but anything yes, else you want to leave yes, them with? Thank you. Yes, that is a way, that is a path for you to unlock.
in any area of your life. It could be in general, or it could be work level play, or it could be just you how you feel about yourself. And what I want to leave you with is this idea that if you can embrace your greatness, you'll find the flow. And when you find the flow, you'll discover success. So it's really more about you accepting the fact that fact that you have a masterpiece you have tremendous unlimited potential that can be that you can access and develop and that only you can do it you can only you can do it so my books are all about the mindful athletes are like foundational that's like a thing and then this new book that i wanted to open up not just the athletes but the whole to everybody and realize that we have this potential to unlock and only we can do it it's an inside job and when we do it 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 for the for the highest good, for the greatest good, it's going to help everybody. It's going to help you. It's going to help us, and it's it's moving towards uh, uh, a more inclusive, compassionate, wise society, universe. Well, George George Mumford, thank you for being a positive ripple out there in the universe. Well, thank you, Sean. Thank you for your work, and thank you for the opportunity to share. And I want to leave everybody with love and blessings, and don't let anybody tell you who you are. <laughs>